Welcome everyone to another episode where we continue to explore the pressure volume diagram for running compression. In the comments for the previous video, I've been asked whether the compression stroke, uh, let's uh, show just uh, that one, whether it uh, resembles the reciprocal function, 1 over x. Uh, what is the importance of that function? It corresponds to the Boyle's law. So let's uh, go and quickly uh, revisit what it is. So Boyle's law states that the pressure expressed as absolute pressure uh, for a given mass of ideal gas will be inversely proportional to the volume it occupies if the temperature and the amount of gas remain unchanged throughout the process. And so mathematically we will be able to write that pressure multiplied by volume will be a constant. Uh, and so the pressure inversely proportional to the volume will give us exactly the reciprocal function. However, if we go and try to plot it on our graph, we will not get the reciprocal function. Our pressure transducer values will be rising faster as the piston approaches the TDC than the blue line, the Boyle's law line, shown here. And the question now becomes how to explain this crazy difference? So there can be only two possibilities. Possibility number one is that Boyle's law is correct and it's the pressure transducers that give out wrong values. Or possibility number two is that Boyle's law for some reason is not good for explaining what happens during the compression stroke. There can really be no other possibilities. And it's not hard to find people in the first camp. For example, on YouTube you can find them posting videos and comments like this that the values reported by WPS 500 are bogus by a factor of 4. Or something like this, that there is no way the crank compression can reach 180 PSI for WPS 500. Or making videos such as debunked and uh, Eric O's overshoot. Basically, it is claimed that there exists a massive conspiracy among tool manufacturers to defraud unsuspecting technicians by selling to them $1,000 pressure transducers that do not even work because they overstate the pressure values compared to what is predicted by Boyle's law both for running and cranking compression. Indeed, if we consider engines that run on a regular gasoline, they typically have compression ratios less than 11. This means that if you start from atmospheric pressure, 0 psi gauge, which is 14.7 psi absolute, then the final pressure, P2, is never going to exceed 14.7 multiplied by the compression ratio 11 which is 162 psi A, or converting back to gauge values, 147 psi gauge. What does this mean? Well, it means that when Ivan here is showing us his compression gauge, 210 psi, we must conclude that his gauge is broken. And when Brandon here is showing us his gauge with 215 psi, we must conclude that his gauge is no good as well. And it's not just the technicians, the automotive engineers for Toyota write here that the compression pressure should be around 218 psi and if it drops to below 145 psi the engine is in really bad shape. So at this point you are either convinced that everybody has bad gauges or you must 
might suspect that there is something not right with uh, using Boyle's law to predict the result of a compression stroke. If you are in the letter camp, watch on because I'm going to explain what's happening. It is true that Boyle's law is often used to illustrate the compression stroke. Yeah. Now, the principles of this are laid down by Boyle's law, and it's the properties of gases under pressure. But Boyle's law has fine print. Well, not really a fine print, but some conditions that are not always stressed enough. And these are that the temperature and the amount of gas should remain unchanged throughout the whole process. Constant amount of gas just means that you have no leaks. Okay, we can assume that. But that the temperature staying constant throughout all of the compression stroke is a big suspect. Indeed, anyone who tried to pump up a bicycle tire from flat to 60 psi would notice that the bottom of the flow pump is getting quite toasty. Gases heat up when they are being compressed. And what does it mean for us? We cannot claim anymore that temperature remains unchanged. And thus, we need something better than Boyle's law to explain what's happening. For example, we can look at something called ideal gas law that links not just the pressure and volume of the gas, but also the amount of substance and the temperature. PV should be equal to nRT. Notice that Boyle's law is a special case of this for N being constant and temperature being constant. In this case, PV is equal to constant. But the ideal gas law is more powerful because it also explains what happens when the temperature rises. So, during the compression stroke, we have the volume going down, denoted here by the blue arrow. The quantity of gas should remain the same, no leaks, and the temperature should be rising, denoted here by the red arrow. And the gas law says that the left-hand side and the right-hand side should remain the same. And for that, you need to have a rapid increase in the pressure, denoted here by two red arrows. Okay, at this point I can stop the video and say, all right, now we have a, an explanation why using Boyle's law is not a good idea to explain all of the compression stroke. But if we actually want the formula that gives us the final pressure during the compression stroke, ideal gas law is not enough because it doesn't really tell us how fast the temperature is rising and thus how fast exactly the pressure is rising. To understand what's going on, we have to dig deeper and add the law of conservation of energy into the mix. You see, when the piston is compressing the gas, it performs work and that energy is getting transferred into the gas. Thus, the temperature of the gas rises. If the compression process is fast enough, there will be almost no time for the heat loss through the cylinder walls. However, if the compression process takes a while, then there will be, there will be some heat loss through the cylinder walls. Let's consider first a situation where the compression process is fast enough so that we can ignore the amount of heat loss. For this situation, we can write some differential equations that drive the process, integrate them, and present the solution. But I really don't feel like doing it uh, in this video. Instead, we are going to ask the guys who know everything about thermodynamics, namely NASA. 
How are we going to do that? Well, it turns out that at some point NASA posted uh, quite a few articles about how engines work uh, to celebrate the 100 years of uh, manned flight. And uh, here we have it, ideal auto cycle. In the fine print at the bottom, they say, we consider ideal auto cycle, there is no heat exchange leaving or entering the gas during the compression, and so this is exactly our situation. So let's focus on the compression stroke. We have a compression ratio, R, and they say that if we start from pressure P2, then finish at pressure P3, the ratio is going to be that compression ratio R raised to the power of gamma, which is called the ratio of specific hits, is equal to 1.4 for air. And this is explaining what will happen to the pressure during the compression stroke when there is no heat loss. Also, they give what happens to the temperatures. So, you can go and actually read the whole article. It's a very good read if you can go through the equations. But what does it mean for us? For us, it means that instead of Boyle's law, which is P multiplied by V is equal to constant, in the extreme case, when no heat is lost to the cylinder walls, we have P multiplied by V raised to the power of 1.4 equal to const. Quite a different function. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to plot it. Plot both functions and compare them. All right, this should be pretty easy to do in Octave. So let's open a fresh copy. And first we need to plot the reciprocal function. Here we go. Not bad. Now we need to add that function with uh, the exponent 1.4. Uh, so let's uh, plan ahead and uh, plot it in a different color. So we need to plot x to the raised to the power of 1.4 again in the region 0.1 to 1 and set the attribute color to red and this is it. What do we have? Well, we have a different curve that starts out pretty much like 1 over x. Remember that's Bell's law, but a little bit after a while it just takes off and ends up far, far, far away from it. Now, this is the whole essence of uh, this function, is that it rises very rapidly. And this is appropriate for compression stroke during high RPM, because that's where the piston is moving so fast that there is absolutely no time for the heat that is being built up to escape through the cylinder walls. However, we have a situation that we can see the cranking speed or uh, about 1000 RPM. So we are not going to see such an extreme situation. There will be some heat loss through the cylinder walls. And so our curve is going to be somewhere between those two extremes, between 1 over x and 1 over x raised to the power of 1.4. How does this function look like? Well, let's take a look at uh, those uh, processes again. 
on the one hand we have PV equal to const. Let's write it down as P multiplied by V raised to the power of 1. And the next one is almost the same, but V is raised to the power of 1, 1 1.4. So why don't we imagine a process that looks like P multiplied by V raised to the power of uh, some other coefficient, let's say nu, where nu is between 1 and 1.4. This process is not new. It has been explored by physicists before. It has a special name, polytropic process, which in Greek I think means the process for multiple uses. And it has this property that it assumes that some of the energy is getting transferred into the gas and some of it is lost to the outside world, just like we discussed when we discussed the compression stroke. And it's no surprise that automotive engineers have tried to use the polytropic processes to explain the results of, for compression stroke. Sometimes they just use it as is, and sometimes they split the stroke into several parts, and for each part they would be using the polytropic process with a specially carefully chosen value of nu. And we are going to do exactly just that for our situation. So let's go back to Octave, where we have our favorite pressure volume diagram, with this curve being the pressure transducer data, and the blue one being the Boyle's law prediction. And we are going to add a polytropic process curve uh, with a coefficient 1.3 for the second half of the compression stroke. So I have a command to do just that. So let's execute it and take a look at the graph. So what we see is that for the second half of the compression stroke, we have almost perfect correspondence to the pressure transducer data. It just goes very closely until it intersects with the Boyle's law prediction at around 270 milliliters. And for the first part of the compression stroke, we can assume that Boyle's law is good enough. And this is the full story how this uh, pressure transducer data can be approximated using piecewise polytropic process curves. And the important thing to uh, remember is that Boyle's law is just not a good idea if you are trying to uh, explain all of the compression stroke due to the temperature of the gas rising during the compression stroke. And I'll wrap up at this. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. You are all heroes for sticking uh, with me for so long. It's a long video, but I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.